So we are about to start. Very to start good. Last talk of this nice conference. And the last speaker of this conference is Professor Jim Stashev. And uh, Jim will uh, talk us. So here we are, or rather, here I am. Here and fast and here. Sorry. Yeah, please. Okay. Whenever you want me to start, let me know. Yes, yes, you. Oh, okay. So this is Jim Stashif. Tim Porter is also attending to correct anything I must say. He's, I'm an expert on part of this. He's an expert on another part. And there's probably some morass in between where neither of us is fully expert. On the other hand, this is a talk where we don't have to worry about that too much. because homotopy coherence has such a rich and varied appearance. Most recently, infinity local systems, my interest there was sparked by my colleague at Penn, Jonathan Block, though we look at it very differently. Toward the end of the talk, I'll tell you more about that. Major point of my talk is that homotopy coherence has so many different manifestations and sometimes uh, one tribe isn't aware of what the other tribe is doing. So here we try to provide some insights and don't expect any th theorems proved, perhaps even rarely stated. So we hope that by providing some way of thinking about homotopy coherence behind, beyond the technicalities, there will be further applications to math and math physics, not only by us, but by other people. And in fact, we have started a homotopy coherence workshop. If anybody is interested in joining, they should send me an email. So very briefly, these are some of the topics in approximately the order they will appear. As you can see, homotopy coherence applies to a lot of different things. Give you just a moment to read that. Otherwise, I will be going too quickly. Okay, so what's a homotopy coherent diagram? Well, it starts with the di usual diagram of objects and morphisms, or if you prefer, points and arrows, where commutativity is not necessarily holding, but is replaced by explicit homotopies for giving coherence of the closed loops in your diagram. But these homotopies, in turn, are coherently linked to higher homotopies and so on and so forth. Uh, that's the point. It hides a lot of structure, which is important. Not just in its existence, but the actual forms. So let's back up to where things started approximately. I would date it to 1957. You'll find out in a little while who I have in mind, and it's not me. And of course, the name comes up a lot later. Even in 1973, Rainer Volt, as a spinoff from his work with Boardman on what turned out to be everything homotopy spaces, the wording was up to coherent homotopies. The phrase homotopy coherence, as far as we know, is due to Cordier in 1980. So it's a slow evolution. The predecessor of homotopy coherence that I'm hinting at arose in the context of topological H spaces. It grew over time and recently has been expressed with new vigor 
in relation to infinity local systems, which we'll get to eventually, working our way up historically. We start with an example in the context of topological age spaces. Again, they weren't called homotopy coherent at that time. It's the structure on the base loop space of a base space. So here we'll look at that from just one point of view. There's a lot of rich structure involved, which could be presented in other ways. So consider the homotopy traditionally used in introductory courses to show associativity up to homotopy. So if lambda one and lambda two are paths, the composition by juxtaposition, I'll just denote by juxtaposition. Then we have that bracketing one way is only homotopic to bracketing the other way. So we can choose the traditional explicit homotopy, which basically gradually reparametrizes, stopping in the middle when it's divided up to into thirds. but there's much more going on. So the history begins implicitly when Sugawara in 1957 obtained criteria for a space to be a homotopy associative base space or even a loop space. When I was a graduate student at Princeton, my supervisor, John Moore suggested I look at when a primitive cohomology class is in fact the suspension of a class that is a loop class. That is, when is a map from y into k pi n so that primitive makes sense, y being an edge space, when does it induce, when is it induced by a map from k to k pi n plus one? That was just about the time that Sugarbauer's work appeared. Uh, I don't know how I was fortunate enough to find it unless John pointed me toward it. And anyway, Sugawara had an infinite sequence of conditions, higher homotopies, which were generalizations of homotopy associativity. Oh, by the way, my H space always has base points and all my discussion of homotopies are relative to base points in an appropriate sense. I won't bother to write down those details. On the other hand, Suwara also had conditions involving homotopy inverses. And fortunately, they could be avoided for what I went on to do. I don't think I would ever have worked through all the higher dimensional subtleties if I had to keep track of homotopy inverses. Okay, so to systematize a family of specific higher homotopies, A and N spaces and more generally A infinity spaces were introduced in 1961. So an A N space consists of a space together with a coherent set of maps parameter space, k sub k, with that many variables all mapped into x. Here, k sub k is the, by now, well-known k minus two dimensional associohedron. Originally presented just as a finite self complex, it was belatedly realized uh, over two decades later that it really was a polytope in the strict combinatorial geometric sense. That is cut out by higher, cut out by hyperplanes in a space of the appropriate dimension. I tried to find a picture I could present to you. So instead I'll suggest you have a look at this marvelous collection by Stefan Forsey, 
not only of the isosahedra and the multiplahedra and the cyclohedra and many others. For the case of the isosahedron, there's at least one graphic realization as an animated, so you can turn it around and see what it looks like from different points of view. So sometimes it's called the stash of polytope or stash of polyhedron. Notice I put so-called in quotes because it shouldn't be. It was in fact considered by Dove Tamari about six years earlier in 1951. On the other hand, Tamari's point of view was quite different from mine. Primarily, but it's just as inspiring for later works in a different direction, that of geometric combinatorics. For a wealth of offspring in, from both points of view, homotopy theory and combinatorics, there's the book, Sociohedra, Tamari Lattices and Related Structures, which has a wealth of the progeny of Tamari and myself. We never met. Cellular chains on the original isosahedra were quickly recognized as giving rise to A infinity structures in a differential graded category. Using the cellular structure, it's possible to consider, in fact, in any category with a reasonable notion of homotopy. By the way, if I'm going too fast, slow me down. Not being able to see your facial reaction, uh, feel free to interrupt. For example, in 1993, Fukaya introduced A infinity categories, which bear his name. Another important source of such A infinity structures is the transfer structure through homotopy equivalences, and even somewhat more generally. For example, suppose A has an algebraic structure, say an associative project product on topological spaces or chain complexes, and its homotopy equivalent to something else C, which is homotopy equivalent to A, but not necessarily having any sort of structure at all. I call the homotopy equivalence as little play going from A to C and little C going from C to A so that it's easy to keep track of which way they're going. So we can define a product on C just by going by the map C into A cross A, multiplying in A and then projecting back into C using A. Will it be associative? It's a product and units can be taken care of, but it won't necessarily be associative. On the other hand, it will be homotopy associative. If you chase the appropriate diagram and use the fact that AC is homotopic to the identity, you'll find you have a specific associated, associating homotopy. And then if you go on, and it's a good exercise, uh, really get a feeling for what's going on just by chasing through that particular question of homotopy associativity. But it then carries on and there's a whole machinery to show in fact that you get an A infinity structure. The second example is the, oh, this silly thing. Uh, whoops, back up. Over a field, the homology of an associative DG algebra is homotopy equivalent to A. The homotopy transfers from A to H of A and produces an A infinity structure on H of A. That A infinity structure on H of A 
makes it equivalent to A, of course, not as an associative algebra, but as the appropriate notion of an A infinity morphism. Okay, another example, consider a group, a space on which D acts as representations or by a homomorphisms, and we have a corresponding C with the maps A and C. Is C some sort of G space? That is, is there some sort of action of G using the homotopy equivalence? Yes, it inherits a homotopy coherent action of G, which in a little while we'll say precisely what that means. It's also known as a representation up to homotopy of G on C. Now, homotopy coherent diagrams and functors. Again, there's quite a history here, fits and starts. Reiner Vogt in 1973, as a spinoff from his earlier work with Boardman on what turned out to be infinite loop spaces and eventually leading into operads, Vogt gave a fairly elementary explicit description of what later was recognized in terms of a homotopy coherent diagram. I still haven't said what that means. Cordier in 1980 show that given A, say a small category, then a homotopy coherent diagram of type A in for example, in the category of topological spaces can be described in terms of a homotopy coherent functor from the simplicially enriched category generated by A, and then Cordier and Tim in 1986 presented homotopy coherence for diagrams more generally, and to my mind, more clearly and simply. So for G, a small category, a strict C diagram is just a functor that think of it as a diagram where there's a point for each object in the category and an arrow from point to point for each morphism in the category. So homotopy coherent diagram is then provided by a homotopy coherent functor, except I still haven't told you precisely what that means. So in order to give you the definition, let me use the notation <clears throat> of the composable morphisms forming a subspace of the n-fold product of the morphisms. Well, here's the formal definition. I'll have a few comments on it before, but before I say that, when I had my first postdoc position, actually in those days, they weren't called postdocs. Only the physicists did that. So I gave my first lecture on my thesis. Dan Kahn was in the audience and he took me aside afterwards and said very gently, just because you've written a formula on the blackboard doesn't mean you've communicated with your audience. So let me try and communicate. The main point is that when we apply this homotopy coherent functor at one value of the cubical parameter, we get just the composition of functors. And at the other end, we get an iterated, apply the functor to get more input, then apply the functor again. We will see that pattern of cubicle stuff coming up over and over again, where in one way it's a composition, the formula at the bottom will 
look slightly different. Now, one way of describing what was going on here actually goes back to Sugawara again, the notion of a strongly homotopy multiplicative map, or as Victor Guggenheim liked to say, a schmap of associative H spaces. It's useful here and makes sense of, in any category, again, with a reasonable notion of homotopy. For example, the classical Durham theorem says that Durham's map at the cochain level from singular cochains to differential forms induces an isomorphism cohomology with real co coefficients. At the cohomology level, it's actually multiplicative. That is to say that the wedge product goes over um, that the uh, Alexander Whitney product goes over into the product of differential forms. The induced map respects that algebra structure, but not at the cochain level. Victor Guggenheim showed that Durham's map was in fact strongly homotopy multiplicative. That is to say, the cup product mapped to the wedge product up to homotopy. More recently, R.S. Abad and Florian Schatz used Guggenheim's result and those of Agusa and Plox Smith that we will see later to study the integration of representations up to homotopy of a Lie algebra to those of its infinity groupoid. If you don't know what those words are, uh, it's not crucial. The emphasis will be on the various ing other ingredients, which we will, I will keep talking about and will eventually get to. So this brings us to the homotopy coherent nerve, or rather it brings us closer to it. So first of all, what's the simplicially enriched category? It's one in which the morphisms are given the structure of the simplicial set. Composition is given by simplicial maps. Face and degeneration operators respect those composition. Using this fancy S for simplicially enriched, we will call these S categories to not have to keep saying over and over again, simplicially enriched. So now we can try and make sense of a homotopy coherent diagram in any S category. And therefore from the diagram, we can get a nerve. But first we need to look at the free S category on the ordered set. Now you might think being simplicial, it looks like simplices, but no, here's what it looks like. Vertices correspond to non-degenerate edge paths from zero to N, fair enough. Case N equals zero and N equals one, there's almost nothing to say, but already for two, we have two non-degenerate paths that lead from zero to two. The arrow at the bottom that goes straight across and the arrow, the arrow pair that goes up and back down. Think of a double-headed arrow or the equivalent of a morphism going from the bottom arrow up to the composition of the two diagonal upper. So there's just uh, one path at the bottom and one path over the top. So essentially we have a one simplex or a unit interval. In fact, you can think of that horizontal arrow is gradually moving up until it bends enough to fit onto the broken path. If we go to three, life gets more interesting. There are four non-degenerate paths of the standard two simplex going from zero to three. So there are four vertices and four edges, we get a square. 
And in general, we get an N minus one Q. So that's the reason that this section is titled from simplex to cube, because this pattern will appear again and again. Another way of thinking of these relations in terms of the topological space of paths in delta N from zero to N as an N minus one cube is literally as a family of paths in the topological sense, that is continuous maps from the interval into the space of paths, which are constant for, for the value n equals zero, gamma two is the identity from the interval to the one simplex, but then at the boundary of the cube, we get again, dropping out the coordinate, we will just restrict to the remaining paths. And similarly here, we will get the composition of paths. Again, reminiscent of that pattern we saw earlier. Such maps were first introduced by Frank Adams in the topological context, just by using the contractibility of the simplex, the standard argument where you have the map defined on the boundary and you can extend it to the interior. Later specific formulas were introduced by KT Chen and then equivalently, but more transparently by Agusa. Let me go back and look at that picture again. Now, literally we would have a topological path running from zero to two. That is a continuous map of the interval from zero to two and the other one that goes up and then back down. And then we fill in with a whole bunch of paths which choose various different ways of going from here to there. Now in Agusa's case, he draws some very nice pictures of the homotop, the paths that fill in the whole tetrahedron. And so you can see that they do form a square. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to show up very well on my screen. And so probably even less so if I try to, to show it to you. Uh, but don't hesitate to look at the Goose's paper on iterated intervals, a topic that's hiding in this portion of what I'm saying, as KT Chen's name will bring to mind for some of you. Or if you'd like a copy of the picture, just send me email and I will happily uh, look at it, uh, supply it for you. Okay, so we finally get to a homotopy coherent nerve. So given a simplicially enriched category, the homotopy coherent nerve, which is sometimes denoted nerve sub H dot C dot, I think there should be a more pleasant notation, but at the moment it's a simplicial set in quotes for the usual argument about it's too big to be really a set. Anyway, it's defined to be a set of simplicially enriched functors from that standard one, which we introduced for this purpose and whatever category you're talking about. Alternatively, there's an adjoint functor, which goes the other way. It goes from simplicial sets to DG categories, and it's defined as follows. Define lambda of K for a simplicial set to be the DG category with the same objects in degree zero, but then a chain complex for the morphisms. What are the morphisms? Well, they can be expressed as similar, very similar to the bar construction as a sequence of generators, elements of the chain complex, all of positive degree, but crucially where the target of one is the source of the next. 
then the quotient is taken with respect to the relations that if there's a generate one simplex, you can <laughs> drop it out of the notation. Uh, and excuse me, I'm yeah. sorry for interrupting. Excuse me. Uh, oh, please. There, yes, uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, 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 at which point uh, 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 did you introduce a DG category uh, as opposed to simplicially enriched category? Okay. Um, the adjoint, uh, uh, the adjoint does not go. Uh, yeah. To, I'm, to I'm, simplicially enriched categories. Right. I'm short circuiting things. And I must admit, I'm a little uncomfortable with this part of it. Uh, when we get to the end of the talk, maybe I can get Tim to express it more clearly. Uh, you're quite right, though. Focus on this expression. I was about to say that finally, if any degenerate simplex greater than of dimension greater than one, then you make that sequence equivalent to zero. Whoops. Oh, that's interesting. Composition is given by putting paths together in the obvious way, just concatenation. Again, think of these as paths going around the edges of a simplex. Ooh. Uh-oh, I think I'm going to have to reload. My apologies. Sure. Yep, okay. I will have to reboot the files. Seems to me something is always going wrong. Okay, let's just get out of here totally and start over. While I'm fussing with this, if there's anything else you'd like to ask. Oh, come on. Perhaps I could uh, answer that question whilst you're reloading, Jim. Uh, Excellent. Please, please do. <laughs> The, the point is, Jim has, as he said, he skipped something. Uh, the uh, definition of the left adjoint of the homotopy coherent nerve is basically standard in the same way it's like a geometric realization. For this, for these models of the um, the simplices. What Jim's uh, done is he uh, going from that to the analogous situation where instead of taking simplicially enriched categories, you've got DG categories where there is this um, explicit construction using the bar resolution type idea to get the left adjoint. It's possible to do it from the other way, but uh, it, the discussion seems to have got lost in the wash somewhere. So I hope that helps. And if you want more help, uh, more details of that, I can I can give it. Thank you. As I said at the beginning, this is very much joint work, uh, including on the slides. Uh, Tim has been kind enough to keep checking what I've created for slides uh, frequently, but as you can see, um, now let's see if this version, okay. 
Yeah, here's indeed what he was just trying to explain. I short circuited considerably. I do want to look at this adjoint functor, except it's not exactly adjoint to the homotopy nerve. There's a relation which Tim has just tried to explain, and he has some very detailed notes for anyone who's trying to catch up. So this was just an attempt to discuss it. Uh, the important point here is how the differential is defined. And it's basically that of the Cobar construction. I'll have some other references later where this is quite important. Okay, so what's a representation up to homotopy? I kind of like that abbreviation that it's a Ruth. Returning to our original setting, closely rated concepts are the following. I've listed in historical order, since this is one case where the younger generation is sometimes unaware of their predecessors. As far as I know, the first representation, uh, first use of the phrase, representation up to strong homotopy, or SHREP, was in 1988. I was very happy in Sam's talk yesterday that he did use the phrase strong homotopy, because it's mostly disappeared from the literature. So by 2004, it was reduced to just be calling a homotopy representation. Then that was spelled out in 2009 or a little earlier as a representation up to homotopy. And that seems to be the current fray, uh, nomenclature though it may disappear uh, from the, maybe supplanted as these others have been. So what, what's in mind here is a representation of some algebraic thing with a homomorphism into the uh, automorphisms of some object. So in a category it makes sense, a representation of the homotopy as a strongly homotopy multiplicative map from something algebraic to the endomorphism object. It's sometimes interesting to use the adjoint action up to homotopy, which then looks as follows. Uh, again, Here's the composition as usual. And here we have the iterated rather than the composite uh, as in that one example we saw earlier. Finally, let's get to infinity local systems. Classically around 1938, the idea of just local system of coefficients grew up in studying the cohomology of covering spaces, that is where the fibers of the map are discrete. Then a few years later, Steenrod defined cohomology with coefficients in a local system of groups, generalizing from covering spaces to fiber bundles. The action on the various fibers of the fundamental groupoid on the base is the needed, is used to show how the cohomology of the total space is built from twisting the fibers as you go along. This leads to an important link between representation theory and the theory of vector bundles. That's well established. The point from the homotopy point of view is to try to generalize as much as possible of that to a category with homotopy. And that's, for example, done in the following way. So ordinarily, for a smooth vector bundle with a connection, a path in the base and a specified initial point in the total space gives a unique lifting, 
and hence the classical holonomy as a representation of the fundamental group or groupoid of the base manifold. Once again, there's more going on, hiding behind passing to homotopy classes. So just give you an impression of what's going on. For a differential graded vector space, we can define higher homotopy by lifting not just the unit interval, but by lifting the simplex with appropriate conditions. I won't bother to spell them out, but I will make use of the simplicial set of smooth, in the smooth case or continuous uh, singular simplices in the general topological setting. And so now we're ready for infinity local systems. On a space X with values in the simplicially rich category, it's just a map of simplicial sets from the, notice I write simp rather than sing, because at some point cubes of X would be important. So simplices of X into the category in question. Now, if it's an ordinary category, then it factors through the quotient homotopy category, which is the fundamental groupoid. Or if we choose the base point, it's the classical holonomy representation of the fundamental group. Now, an interesting candidate for the target category is that a category of chain complexes. And so we get essentially a homotopy coherent functor. So what am I saying? Excuse me, did I? Sorry about that, okay. Sorry about that. Anyway, we finally get to Block and Smith, Jonathan Block being my colleague at Penn and my being in a little bit on the development of, of his work with his student, Aaron Smith. So they think of the classical Riemann Hilbert equivalence as a functor from the category of flat vector bundles to the category of representations of the fundamental group. So they give a generalization to the category of flat differential graded vector bundles suitably defined for which the fiber is a differential graded vector space. And they, then they get to representations of the homotopy of that simp space. So what they introduce is an infinity local system on M. Their notation is here, pi infinity of X is precisely simp M. Their generalization involves construction of quasi-equivalence of DG, DG categories between the category of DG vector bundles with flat graded connection and the DG category of infinity local systems on M. The functor from bundles with flat connection is precisely given by that lifting I hinted at earlier, the tau n taking an n simplex into the total space. Notice we're lifting to that level, to the simplicial level from the classical level where we do not have a differential and we just get representations of the fundamental group. This work of Block and Smith has inspired several other works. Here's one very interesting example to me because it ties together many of the other project, projects I've been involved with over the years. Manuel Rivera and Mahmoud Zainalian 
use both infinity local systems, but also the realization of a simplex as a family of paths parameterized by the cube. So notice again, we have that transition from simplices to cubes. They use this to provide a new insight into Ed Brown's classical result that the chains on the total space of a vibration are weakly equivalent to a twisted tensor product of chains on the base with chains on the fiber. The twist is a homotopy coherent version of a convolution map from the DG coalgebra of chains on the base to the DG monoid of self homotopy equivalences on the fiber. But now back to the future. Blanc and Smith proved their generalized Hilbert equivalence by first invoking the Serre Swan theorem to change the category to the category of perfect modules with a flat graded connection. Uh, similarly, Lazarev, Holstein, and Chuang have done something similar using cohesive modules. And notice you're not staying in the category in which the problem was phrased. In fact, they admit it would be an interesting problem in its own right to define an inverse functor, functor which makes use of a kind of associated bundle construction. That's what caught my eye. I think it's been a couple of years now, and I'm still trying to make sense out of that. That's work in progress. And definitely the us and perhaps my whole workshop group, but that's to be continued. And that's what I have to say. Please ask questions. Uh, okay, so let's thank Jim for a nice talk.